morning, everyone. As we uh, look at a day, today's sermon, area, topic, transfiguration, racial justice, peace. And as I uh, prepared this sermon today, I thought of the month that we were in. And to everyone who read and not read, happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> I had it on read, but Nick wasn't working right, so <laughs> Mike told me I could stop working out so hard. So. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, my wife had grown enough bread for both of us today. <laughs> we thank God for you today as we bring God's word and his message this morning of, of reconciliation and transfiguration. And so today being, this month being, not only um, Valentine's Day, it's also Black History Month. And one of the most interesting things about Black History Month is when I was sitting there, um, when I was in Utica, you know, every February, at least two of, two of my sermons in that month, I would always uh, do a sermon on, you know, Black History. And, you know, I'm looking at where God has placed me today, well, among you in the congregation of the church. And I've done a lot of history with the congregation of the church. You know, through my seminary studies, when I was here with you seven years ago, and now I'm here with you now. And, 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 and the congregation of the church, believe it or not, and you probably know this, but I'm just telling you, I'm trying to preach to the choir, as they say, that you are very, very much in the center of the abolitionist movement. You are, your history, your church. Your people, your foreparents, are in the center of the abolitionist movement. And so as I thought of today, and I looked at the text of, and I, and I thought of 2 Corinthians 4, 3, and 6, and I thought that my sermon talk should stay the abolitionism and the congregation of the church. And how God used the congregation of the church, how God used the congregation of the church to be a forerunner, to be a preparation, to be a road to walls, freedom and justice for all. And so one of my heroes, believe it or not, if you have not heard his name, is Mr. John Brown. Now John Brown, as you know, is an abolitionist from New England. John Brown, John Brown, summer home was in Lake Placid. John Brown was the man who fled on at Harper's Ferry back in 18, uh, October 16, 1859. Something that he asked Frederick Douglass to get involved in. Frederick Douglass said, you're going to lose. But for some reason, John Brown was convicted by God and by what he believed and what his father told him and what he told his 21 children. That no country that says they love God, love Jesus, could put up with such, such harm and danger to others. So for the few moments, I want to bring to you this message, Abolitionism and the Congregation of Church. My biblical text comes from Paul. Paul saw the Paul who was persecuting the church, the Paul who was the radical, radical apostle for the faith. And look what he says in 2 Corinthians. Even if our gospel is veiled, veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In this case, the God of this world has blinded the men mind of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves that we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is God who said, let your light shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. God, for a moment, I want to just say to the people, let these words, dear God, speak not from me, but from you, God. Let me give a message of hope. Let me give a message of transfiguration and transformation. Most important, God, let me lift the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul speaking about this gospel of Christ being
being veiled, being covered. And then Paul says, the God of this world has blinded the mind of the unbelief, keeping them from seeing the light of the gospel. It was, it was that man named John Brown. John Brown, a bad man. John Brown, a man who would say, you know, enough is enough. John Brown would be a man that would start his roots in the congregation church of Springfield, Massachusetts. That church being called at the time Stanford Street Free Church, now known as St. John's Congregation, congregation Church in Springfield, Massachusetts. It's the same John Brown whose father had said that, that Jesus Christ is not only the light of the world, but Jesus Christ is a liberator. Jesus Christ is the one who can free anyone. Jesus Christ is no respect of the person. Jesus Christ loves everyone. And what we see going on, we cannot tolerate as men of God. We cannot say that God, that God is innocent, God loves us, God wants to take care of us. And yet we see what our brethren are doing. See, John Brown understood that the brethren who were the unbelievers, who believed, because the most interesting part about slavery, you have to understand, my brothers and sisters, is that many people would take slavery, many people would use the Bible to justify slavery. But John Brown saw it as, no, it's a way to bond people. And yet Jesus came so that all men and women can be free. One of the most interesting part about Jesus, and I, and I do believe in my heart that he is not only the light of the world, but he brings peace in the midst of sorrow. He brings hope in the midst of despair. He brings light and utter darkness. But Jesus Christ is also a rebel. Make no mistake about it. Jesus Christ confronted people. One of the most interesting parts about him being on the cross. One of the most interesting parts about him going to the cross. He didn't go to the cross because he was just the nice person who walked around and made everybody feel good. He went to the cross because he confronted people how people were being treated. He went to the cross because he saw how people were being misused. He went to the cross because he said that all men and all men and women, no matter their creed, no matter their nationality, no matter their income, no matter where they live, what town, Galilee, Nazareth, it did not matter. He was concerned about the least of these, a liberator, a person who loved everyone. For it says, the God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. For whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It didn't say some people. It didn't say rich people. It didn't say poor people. It didn't say gay people, straight people. It said all people would be saved under me. And so we find John Brown in this particular. He finds himself saying, we're going to start something. And he goes to Frederick Douglass. And Frederick Douglass being the oracle going from congregation to church to congregation to church. Because let me just say to us, this is something you can be proud of. Many churches would not accept to hear if it wasn't a black church, it was Quaker or a congregation church that would accept the Sojourner Truths, the Frederick Douglasses of the world. That's why this church has such a rich history. That's why this community has such a rich history. People think it's because we allow everybody. Yes! Would Jesus do that? Yes! That's what it was about. But John Brown being convicted, as Paul was convicted in this text, he says, unbelievers are blind by the world. So when I study this text in my context, in my little nightly notes, I asked myself, well, what does he mean by day? A day. And so, many of you know that certain communities veil themselves when they went into certain communities. In particular, in the Jewish and Palestine faith, when a woman was walking in public, she not only veiled herself, but she had to be with other women. Outside of her father or brother, not even her outside of her father or brother, she had to walk and be with them. She could never be with just a friend walking down the block saying, let's go play together. 
Let us go talk to him. But Jesus was different. He was a radical. He had his mom. He had his mother's sister. He had Mary Magdalene. And in fact, many of, uh, if you really read the text, many of the followers that provide for Jesus' ministry and the apostles' ministry were women. They were people who sold spices, get spices. In fact, we all know that when, he went, when Jesus went to the cross and went to the tomb, that it was the women that came to bring spices. And so the women always had a scented part in the ministry. Now, why am I saying that? Am I trying to compare women to African American Latinos? No, what I'm saying is Jesus was all inclusive. And so we find this veil coming off. This is what John Brown says that they're about to hang. He said, the crime of this guilty land will never be plunged away but with blood. He says, I am as content to die for God's eternal truth on this conference. There's no other way. Dick Gregory, you know everybody knows the comedian Dick Gregory. It's fascinating. The last few years I listened to a lot of his speeches as he was, you know, um, he's gotten older and gotten more wise. And he, he talked about three important people that had the greatest influence on the end of slavery. And I said, well, this is interesting. He named three people. He named John Brown, the preacher, abolitionist. He named Harriet Beecher Strokes, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. And he spoke about Mark Twain. Hmm. So when he said Mark Twain, I'm like, okay, now you got to know how way to hear this, right? But he talked about Mark Twain, about Huckleberry Finn. And, he, and the reason why he talked about Mark Twain, he said, because of the first time Mark Twain gave the slave a name and an identity. And I said, wow. And what he was saying was those three groups, right, those three that I just mentioned, literally opened up the charge, right, to start the Civil War. But Beecher Stroke, if you read Uncle Tom's Cabin, and I read it this summer, and it's a long book, y'all, right? It's a long book. You hear a lot of uh, black people, being an African American man, say things like, he's an Uncle Tom. Right? He's an Uncle Tom. And what we really mean is, he's a seller. She's a seller, right? Now, I'm 58 years old. I read that book in 57. Now I understand what an Uncle Tom is. An Uncle Tom is not what people think it is. In fact, what they really should call a person is maybe perhaps a coon or sample. Because that's how Harry Beecher Strokes literally described. Because Uncle Tom was not only a Christian cynic man, he was a man who stood for those that no one else would stand for. When young women were trying to be raped, he was the one that would protect them. He would make sure they would go somewhere else to be protected. He was the one that stood by his faith and never hurt another human being on behalf of the slave master. That's the difference. And so when you read that, but then this is it. This is what I said when I was, this morning. I said, I'm going to tell my congregation, tell the congregation. You have any children. I think there's really probably two books that they really could should read. If they really want to understand kind of some of the nonsense that's going on in our country between race, particularly black women, Uncle Tom's Cabin and the Birth of a Nation. Now why I say Birth of a Nation? Because if you ever see Birth of a Nation, the Birth of a Nation contradicts everything in Uncle Tom's Cabin. And that's why we have so much confusion. Because Harry Beecher Strong basically was trying to tell the world this is really what slavery is like. These are the strong willed people that fought against oppression. And then you got the birth of the nation, which perhaps came out in a movie by our president, which was Wilson, to show the complete opposite. Black women were lazy. Black women were rapists. Black children were, didn't do anything. 
or in small. And so the reason why I say that is because what that does, because one thing about children, what I love, you eventually guys, when I get some college students here, they come. I just gotta wake them up. <laughs> and then I'm gonna get them here. Because they keep gonna come to your church. Chuck gonna come to me and go on me and I'm like, yeah, okay, you say that, you're gonna work on it. But the most interesting part about it is when you hand books to students, especially this generation, they'll read them. And when they read them, they're like, hmm. So this is why this is going on. And this is why that's going on. And this is why that's going on. And so we find ourselves in the midst of all of that, understanding what Dick Gregory said. And this is what Dick Gregory stated about John Brown. He says that, he states, Jesus came to die for my sins. John Brown did. He's the man who not only described, decided to kill for me and die for me, but he took his own sons with him. You can't risk more. And so what Dick Gregory is saying, and what this text is saying, and what I'm saying about the congregational church being the, the trailblazers and the pathfinders, what I'm trying to say is that there is a sacrifice in doing good. There's a sacrifice in being right, but you've got to stand for right. Now, we do live in a society today that perhaps we're not going to lose our life if we carry a Bible or read a Bible. But I will say to you today that there's a time in our lives as we celebrate black history that we have to think about not only our black leaders who have been the bedrock, but the institutions that also work with those leaders. Again, I say, everyone celebrates Abraham Lincoln. But we need to also celebrate those that paved the way to make Abraham Lincoln uncomfortable. And it was the John Browns of the world that made the Abraham Lincoln uncomfortable. See, because Frederick Douglass knew, if I let this with you, not only am you getting harm, but so am I. But John Brown said it was worth it his life, because he understood that no country, no country, I, no country can continue to do this and we sleep well at night. And so I say that today as Paul says that the blind, that the world is blinded, the unbelievable. When I look at what goes on in our country today and I listen to some evangelical Christians, and I ain't gonna say white people, you know why I'm gonna say white? Because I've seen some black ones too. And some Asian ones. I'm just keeping it real. Every day, there's a couple that walk in my neighborhood, right? Can I go there with you for a few minutes? Every day she walks and she has a Native American great hat on. And listen, if, if that's what you think, fine. But I'm gonna share something with you that happened the other night. Me and I were looking at this movie called Genius. It's a good, good movie. Really good movie. Day back in 1929. But the interesting part about the movie is I watched the different businessmen walking in and out of the bank, walking in and out of the publishing companies, and walking in and out of the trains and everything. Every position that a black person had was subservient. And I said to myself, what does make America great mean? To who? To women? To not be able to vote? For black people to be segregated? For Latinos to be stopped at the border? For gay people to be shrunk? Ooh, 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 what does this mean? And then I began to realize, I began to realize, this is about a veil over their eyes. Them not believing. Them believing and thinking they're and I see the Pharisees and Sadducees. They really believed that they were doing the right thing on behalf of God. Jesus said to them many different times, a house of body cannot stand. Good don't know bad, and bad don't know good. Good knows good, bad knows bad. So Jesus said, how can I be evil and help the other people? How can I be evil and have the little children how can I be evil and feeding the sick and feeding the hungry and healing the lame? How can I be evil? But what happens is when the status quo want to keep the status quo, that's what 
find Paul in a Roman prison. The same time he's writing the letters to the Corinthians, he's in a Roman prison in 8, chapter 8. And he's saying to himself and to his brothers and sisters in the text, what can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus? Can heartache, can death, can light, can height, can death, can heaven, can angels, can the devil, nothing will ever separate me from the love of Christ in Christ Jesus. Because my brothers and sisters, just like John Brown and just like Paul, they understood. And just as Jesus said to his disciples, where I'm going, you cannot go. One day you will be able to go. One day what? When, 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 when the mother asked, the mother of John and James that we asked, can my son sit on the side, each side of me? Jesus said, only my Father in heaven can make that determination. However, can you drunk, can you drink from the cup that I drink from? You see, my brothers and sisters, what I'm saying today on this Black History Month is that the congregation the church, you're trailblazers. You're trailblazers. You made a difference. And we still have to make a difference. Because it's still dark and out there. It might be light in the snow, but it's still about, we saw what happened yesterday on TV, y'all. We saw it, and we all have our own opinions of it, right? But you know what my son reminded me this morning? This is what he said. And my son loves Bernie Sanders. This is what my son said. He said, Dad, what McConnell did is a little different than what Bernie Sanders did in 1997, 94. I'm like, what are you talking about? Making on my soul. What are you talking about? He said, Bernie Sanders' son, United States Congress. And then the next minute, the next hour, Bernie Sanders also said the, the devastating impact we have on African Americans. I'm like, okay, you just shut me up. I said, what is this about? He said, that politics. It ain't about race, it's about politics. Well, we saw that politics. I gotta keep minds, protect minds. But anyway, I didn't know people. Represent me, but you know why they represent me? You know why I'm representing them? Because they take care of me. Doesn't matter what's better for the broader community. What matters is for me, myself, and I. If the congregation church thought that way, Charles Rogers couldn't stand here right now. If the congregation church didn't think at that time, back in, you have to remember in 1845, 50, you ain't gonna walk around and be pat on the back. For being part of the slave movement to make sure that the mob slave No, 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 no. Because you know what you're talking about, right? You're talking about money. So you, you're talking about stopping the strong part of a nation that holds its wealth in the hands of slave people. Money. So when you talk about people's money, you got a problem. So I go to conclude with this. The congregation church been like this month, this sermon I spoke to you today. I spoke about it today because I need you to know. And you already know. I'm just singing to the choir, but I want to remind you that our work is still needs to be done. The work is still real. There are still people out there who need a God that loves them. A God that's a liberator. A God that sees past my faults, but finds my heart. A God that searches my heart. Well, what does it search me for? Oh, when, 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 when uh, David, a warrior, did everybody talk about David, sweet David? David was a warrior. That's one of the reasons why God did not allow David to, to build his temple. He said, you have to put blood on him. You are a warrior, David. Yet, God said, and only he said about David, a man after my own heart. And that's what we have to have. We have to have the heart of God. The heart of Jesus. I'm not telling us to go pick up sticks and guns and start running and chasing people. What I am saying is when we sit in those meetings with our family, when we sit in the classroom with our students, when we sit in the group of people, and they say something, we need to be able to say, hey, come on now, let's just call this and see. What is this really about? And that's what Paul was talking about. Unveil the darkness. One of DNI's favorite uh, uh, preachers is Reverend Bob. If you ever see Reverend Barbara, he, he, he's compassionate, he's loving, he's honest, and he speaks for everyone. 
And so that's where the congregation the church found itself in. And that's where the congregation the church continues must find itself. Because God will always remind every one of us in this room when we see him face to face. What did you do with my name? You know, what did you really do with my name? How did people know you? Because as I've said, this is the truth. I'd rather see a sermon than always hear it. See, I can't get up here and talk about the love of God, as I've always said to you every Sunday, and get out there and mistreat students. I can't talk about the love of God and mistreat my children. I can't talk about the love of God and mistreat my friends. I can't talk about the love of Jesus and sit there and deny somebody the same rights I have. Jesus is all inclusive. And that's what John Brown wrote today. And the reason why I talk about it today is because his foundation, just like my foundation came from the Baptist church, John Brown foundation came from the congregation which was born and raised there. And John Brown, I was telling you this morning, John Brown got so rad, he's like, the congregation church is a little too nice. And I'm going, that's okay. That's okay because every person has a season in their life. We all come around the full circle. So my brothers and sisters, as Paul would say, let nothing, let nothing separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Because God loves you all. God loves me. But God also wants us to know in 2021, the battle is not over. The battle continues. And we take it all one day at a time. God bless you.